Okay, in this class, I'm going to be talking about the concept of, of fair use, which we'll be talking about in the next video as well. Fair use is often referred to as the most important exception to copyright ownership. Now, we may as well, there may or may not be the best way of understanding the, the concept of, of fair use, but at least it kind of frames where the fair use analysis comes in the infringement analysis. Uh, so the only time the question of fair use ever arises is when the plaintiff has made out a prima facie claim of copyright infringement. In other words, the plaintiff has shown that they uh, own a valid copyright, that the defendant actually copied some protected element of their work, and that the defendant's work is uh, is substantially similar to their work based on the copying of those protected uh, protected elements. If the plaintiff, if and only if the plaintiff makes that prima facie copyright infringement showing, does then the defendant uh, find themselves in a position where they may have to uh, assert a fair use defense. In other words, they may have to show that despite the plaintiff's showing of prima facie copyright infringing, their use is a non-infringing use because it falls within the category of uses that we have chosen to describe as, as fair. Now, um, the concept of fair use was originally uh, developed as, in effect, a gloss on the Copyright Act and the scope of copyright protection under federal law uh, by the federal court. It's a kind of federal common law exception to copyright ownership and the exclusive rights of copyright owners, uh, like so much else in copyright law, right? It's like the statute uh, provided the, a skeleton of the law and the courts kind of fleshed it out with legal doctrine. And the courts continued to develop the concept of fair use independent of the actual textual language of of the Copyright Act, right? So the Copyright Act at the time did not explicitly provide for fair use, but the courts, uh, the, the courts developed a fair use doctrine as a necessary corollary to copyright protection, uh, primarily in order to recognize uh, various conventional, constitutional, and arguably pragmatic limitations on the scope of copyright protection. It's, we're kind of worth keeping those in mind when we think about fair use. Where did it come from? Well, it came from, on, on one level, a recognition that copyright is fundamentally about controlling speech. And obviously, that necessarily raises uh, First Amendment-related, uh, free speech-related concerns. And so in order to square copyright protection with the First Amendment, fair use provides a kind of safety valve. Right, it says uh, certain kinds of uses are non-infringing, even if they satisfy the criteria for uh, for for prima facie infringement, uh, because we look to them as uses that are treated as non-infringing in order to ensure that we don't in, that, that that the uh, application or the existence of copyright protection and the ability to enforce it uh, doesn't intrude upon people's ability to engage in First Amendment protected free speech. In other words, copyright is to be seen as in effect a, a commercial right that uh, as a commercial right doesn't uh, infringe and can't be permitted to infringe on people's ability to engage in First Amendment protected speech. But, but there are additional reasons to think that we, uh, we might want to have a fair use exception. On one level, we might think of it as a way of uh, ensuring that copyright protection doesn't lead to uh, inefficiencies, transactions costs, which might create market failures or inefficiencies in the market for uh, protected protected works, uh, original works of authorship. Now, obviously, it's not going to, doesn't even purport to solve all potential transactions costs or prevent all transactions costs and solve all potential market failures that might be generated by copyright. But maybe it can at least help mitigate some of the more some of the more serious ones. In other words, uh, we might look to fair use as a way of ensuring that copyright owners can't assert copyright ownership when it would be uh, inefficient uh, for them to do so. And, uh, and also to ensure that defendants might know 
or at least theoretically be have some comfort that uses might not be treated as infringing, even if they're technically infringing, uh, insofar as we think a category of uses might be one we might want to encourage and, and, and permit. Um, so in any case, fair use existed as a common law, federal common law exception to the exclusive rights of copyright owners for uh, most of copyright history. But when copyright did this major revision of the Copyright Act in 1976, uh, in order to effectively square the language of American copyright law with the Berne Convention by effectively adopting most of the language and the concepts embodied in the Berne Convention. Congress at least arguably saw that, or it was generally seen to the extent that policymakers were considering it as a moment in which it was necessary to reflect in, in the statute itself, the fact that fair use was a fundamental principle of United States copyright law and to explain what that might look like. And so the intention of the uh, codification of fair use into the Copyright Act as section 107 was explicitly, as mentioned in the legislative history and notes to, to, the, to the provision, uh, to codify the existing federal common law of fair use that the courts had developed. Now, question whether or not codification of a federal common law principle is actually possible, right? Perhaps the codification necessarily uh, preempts the federal common law uh, rules and in effect stands in for those rules. Of course, then when the courts go back to interpret the uh, codified fair use provisions, perhaps they might re, uh, reinvest or reimbue, as it were, the statutory language with a new, perhaps inflected version of that uh, common law, those common law principles that had already been developing. In any case, we can see, you can see the text of the fair use statute uh, in front of you. Uh, essentially what it says is that despite the uh, exclusive rights of copyright owners under uh, section 106 and 106A, the moral rights provision under VERA, right? So fair use applies to both the exclusive rights of copyright owners and the moral rights, the exclusive economic rights of copyright owners and the exclusive moral rights of copyright owners under, under VERA, uh, fair uses are not infringing, right? So despite those exclusive rights, fair uses are not infringing and essentially the statute tries to provide guidelines for what counts as a fair use. So it provides some examples, uh, uh, criticism, commentary, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, research. It's intended to be a non-exclusive list, intended presumably to provide a sense of what categories of uses of a work of authorship might tend to fall within the scope of fair use. Uh, and then it instructs courts to consider certain statutory factors in making the determination as to whether or not particular uses are in fact fair use, right? So look to the purpose and character of the use, look to the nature of the copyrighted work which has been copied, look to the amount and substantiality of the, um, of the work that was actually copied by the alleged infringer, and uh, finally look to the effect of the use on the potential market uh, for, for, the, for the copyrighted work. In other words, look to whether or not the, 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 the new work, the derivative work that's uh, being accused of infringing is in a sense a substitute for the original work or not. It's usually the way that that fourth factor is, is construed. And then there is a, a final provision that says that uh, the fact that work is unpublished doesn't necessarily bar a uh, finding that a use is fair. And that grew out of uh, a, a previous Supreme Court decision, uh, Harper and Rowe, in which uh, the Supreme Court based its finding that the use of a, uh, elements from, from a book, uh, autobiography written by uh, Gerald Ford, President Gerald Ford, uh, was not a fair use because uh, at the time of the use, the book had not yet been published. Congress, in response to that Supreme Court decision, actually amended the fair use statute to uh, explicitly state that unpublished works could be the subject of a fair use finding as well. Uh, obviously not saying they had to be, but simply saying that the fact that a work is unpublished doesn't preclude a, a fair use finding under, under the circumstances. Now, at least in theory, these four factors are a, a balancing test 
and they're intended to be treated as, uh, as non-exclusive and merely as a guide to the uh, finding of fair use. As a practical matter, doctrinally, courts inevitably walk through these four factors when doing the, the fair use analysis, for better or for worse, right? We'll, we'll, we'll ask ourselves in class whether or not the four factors are actually particularly helpful in uh, ultimately making a fair use determination, at least as currently framed, uh, how courts consider them kind of in context and whether looking at them as uh, kind of discrete independent uh, factors is really a productive way of, of using them. Uh, and, you know, in addition, whether or not there are additional considerations that maybe courts should or even do take into account when making a fair use finding. Uh, spilling the beans a little bit, uh, I think the reality is that uh, the four fair use factors are used by courts primarily as a method of uh, explaining how they reached a conclusion rather than guiding the courts to that conclusion. Uh, cynically, we might look at the four fair use factors as a form formula for courts to uh, attempt to insulate their ultimate determinations on the question of fair use from, from review. Uh, of course, they, it's not a foolproof form of insulation, but it helps uh, to prevent those courts uh, being second-guessed by uh, either intermediate courts of appeal or by by the Supreme Court, right? So, you know, maybe don't take too literally the analysis of the factors in determining the outcome. Uh, we might think more holistically about what fair use is for, what it's intended to accomplish, and how that ought to cause us to think about the particular circumstances presented to the court. Okay, that said, what's our kind of instruction for how to think uh, through these four factors in particular circumstances? Well, uh, generally, uh, the first and the fourth factors are seen as the most important in the fair use analysis. They're the ones typically seen to be guiding the uh, ultimate outcome of the fair use analysis. And I would suggest that they're actually uh, really interlocked with each other in important ways, right? So the first fa factor, purpose and character of the use, is typically characterized as a uh, uh, instructing courts to ask whether or not the, uh, uh, the accused work has transformed the original work into something new and different. This concept of transformativeness is really critical to the fair use analysis, uh, but it can also transform itself to mean lots of different things depending on the nature of the work in question and the nature of the use in question, right? So the, the concept of transformativeness does a lot of work, but it's not exactly clear what kind of work it's really doing, and it seems quite malleable to uh, to kind of form itself to whatever the particular circumstances presented to the uh, reviewing court are. Uh, the fourth factor asks the court to look to the effect on the market for the work. In other words, to ask, is the uh, new work, the derivative work, a substitute for, for the original work, a market substitute? In other words, um, would consumers be indifferent to which one they purchased, or arguably, would it uh, would it undercut the market for the for the for the plaintiff for the copyright owner of the original works uh, uh, market. Now, that could mean a lot of different things and really the market for what. Um, if we think of it as market for the work itself right, under the reproduction right, okay, well that's a that you know allows for a lot. Of fair use. If we think of it as the market for potential derivative works, well, then all of a sudden it's sort of question begging, right? I mean, because in theory, the uh, owner of the original work could always have made this precise derivative work in question, and uh, the derivative work uh, in question would then undermine the uh, copyright owner's uh, ability to uh, claim exclusivity over that particular kind of derivative work. So it's got to be fall somewhere in between those two. It can't reduce fair use to mean everything except direct uh, literal copying of the original, but it also can't mean uh, fair use kind of disappears to a point and doesn't protect anything that uh, would even potentially qualify as a derivative work copying original element in, in the first place. Okay, 
In addition, courts are instructed to ask about the nature of the copyrighted work uh, with the understanding that fact-based works like news, like uh, nonfiction, uh, are going to be entitled to less copyright protection in the face of potential fair uses than other ca categories of works might be. In other words, when you're making use of a work that depends on facts about the world or true uh, or false statements, um, then, uh, then you're, you're your ability to use that work has to be broader, uh, in large part in order to reflect the strictures of the First Amendment, right? In other words, in order to preserve free speech from uh, being restricted by, by copyright, we need to be able to ensure that people are able to talk about the world uh, that is around them. Uh, but we kind of, we expect there to be, or we, um, we you know, provide for somewhat uh, narrower scope of fair use protection in the case of fictional works in the sense that or in the expectation that when it comes to fictional works, you can always generate a new fictional, you know, new, new fictional work or new fictional context. And so your need to rely on a pre-existing fictional context is, is smaller. Now, we can reflect on whether or not that's true, especially in light of how people actually engage in the uh, production of uh, fictional works of, of, of make-believe universes and uh, the extent to which artistic production is oftentimes uh, highly dependent upon uh, access to broader context in order to make sense and kind of tap into the to the sort of discourse surrounding it. Uh, nevertheless, right, there is a sense in which you know we distinguish between fictional and non-fictional works and give more, in effect, more copyright protection to fictional works than non-fictional ones. And then the third factor uh, instructs the court to look to the amount and character uh, or the amount of, of the uh, work actually used. Essentially the idea being that the more that you use, the more likely that the work is, that the use is not fair. And the less that you use, the more likely that the use is fair. There's no kind of hard and fast rule, despite any, what anyone tells you, right? There's no like, you know, use less than 40 words or, you know, use less than 5% or whatever. That's all baloney, none of it's true. Uh, using an entire work can be a fair use as well, depending on the context of the use and depending on how the use actually uh, is, is uh, realized. Okay, so, uh, Oftentimes we think about fair use in the context of creating, in effect, derivative work. So using some but not all elements of a work protected by copyright to create a non-literal copy of the original. In other words, to create a derivative work which resembles because of the copying the original work, but is not the same as a copyright work. But fair use can also uh, be uh, asserted successfully in a context of literal copying, so long as the purpose of the literal copying doesn't affect, uh, in the relevant way, the market for for the plaintiff's uh, copyrighted work of authorship. And Sony, the Universal Studios, is uh, a a great example. Of, of how that kind of, what I like to refer as consumptive fair use analysis might work. So, so this is really a uh, infringement case about the uh, original VCR, uh, really the Betamax with VTR, videotape recorder, uh, and that was sort of a generic term for any device that recorded uh, uh, audio video, audio, audio visual works on magnetic cassette tapes. And the key thing to be in mind here is that Prior to the introduction of the Sony Betamax VTR recorder, there was no practical way for consumers to uh, create or watch at home their own uh, versions of audio visual works independent, right? So if you wanted to watch a particular film, for example, you had to go to the movie theater to see it, right? It was very difficult and expensive to get any kind of audio visual work, any kind of movies that you could watch. Uh, at home uh, without going to a, a public location. A very different entertainment universe than we're used to today, right? If you wanted to watch, uh, wanted to watch movies or television, you had to wait until they were broadcast by a television station and then watch them when they were being broadcast. And if you missed them, you're just out of luck. You'd have to wait until they did it again. So the VCR was a big uh, was, a, was a big boon for consumers uh, because it enabled you to create uh, recordings of the television uh, shows that you liked and you could watch them 
at a more convenient time uh, or as many times as you wanted to. Uh, it also enabled you to rent copies of movies or buy copies of movies that had been recorded onto videotape and watch them at home as well. However, that latter use was not one that was really initially necessarily anticipated when the v, when the VTR was initially introduced. The idea was that you know you would essentially use it as a way of recording things off of the television so that you could watch them later. Now the uh, the movie studios were horrified by this new invention. They were convinced that it was going to destroy their entire business model. They were in the business of producing movies for for people to watch uh, for people to watch in the theater. That was how they made all their money. And they also licensed movies to, uh, to television stations to broadcast, right? Well, they were concerned that if people could watch videotapes of, uh, of, of broadcast movies whenever they wanted to, they'd A, stop going to the movie theater, right? And B, they would fast forward past the commercials and then the broadcasters would not be willing to pay them as much money in licensing fees because the purchases of the commercials wouldn't be willing to pay them as much. And this would negatively affect their ability to generate revenue from these expensive uh, audiovisual works, expensive movies that, that they were producing. Uh, they knew they couldn't, practically speaking, bring infringement actions against individual consumers who are using this machine in order to uh, create copies, right, in order to create videotapes at home, right? In order to practically uh, and effectively bring an infringement action, they had to bring it against Sony, right? The manufacturer of the machine who was providing the machine to consumers and enabling consumers to engage in, in infringement, right? So what was the nature of the claim here? It was essentially that uh, Sony was facilitating copyright infringement by consumers by providing them uh, with the VTR, a tool without which they would be incapable as a practical matter of uh, engaging in this form of copyright infringement. What was the copyright infringement in question? It was literally taping things off television, right? You plug your you plug your VTR into your TV tuner, right, and set it to the right to whatever channel you want, and you could then create a videotape of whatever was being broadcast. The uh, the movie studios said, "Look, we're copyright owners in those audiovisual works. When a consumer presses record on the VTR, they are literally engaging in copyright infringement. They are exercising the reproduction right without our permission. That is." unquestionably a prima facie copyright infringement. Therefore, they are infringers because they could not infringe without this device. Uh, Sony is aiding and abetting the infringement and therefore Sony is contributorily liable or uh, indirectly liable for, for their infringement. What was Sony's defense? It was effectively, look, we're just providing consumers with a tool. Some of those uses are presumptively infringing, but not all of them. Right. After all, not everything that's broadcast on television is protected by copyright. Some of the things are in the public domain, right? Some of the things are, for example, uh, used to be protected by copyright but aren't anymore. Other things are, you know, broadcast by public television. Maybe they want it to be in the public domain. Maybe some of those shows are being broadcast by by producers, by copyright owners who want consumers to be able to make copies, right? They don't want to assert copyright infringement uh, claims under the circumstances. They want to essentially give a unilateral license to everyone to create recordings and, and watch, watch them at home, right? So not everything is protected uh, and not everything, uh, not all copyright owners want to assert protection. In fact, they brought uh, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers of uh, children's television fame in to testify that he thought VCRs were great and that people should be able to use them to record uh, Mr. Rogers neighborhood for, for their children. Uh, but in addition, Sony made the argument, which was very compelling for the court, that one of the ways that people used VCRs was to simply create recordings of television shows in order so that they could watch them at a different time. This is referred to as time shifting, right? The idea being that consumers just want to be able to watch what they want to watch at a convenient time. They don't want to have to watch it when it's being broadcast, especially if they can't be present when it's being broadcast. And the VTR, in effect, enables them to watch 
the same programming they'd otherwise be able to see merely at a more convenient time. Well, the concern from the movie studios was that people were not just going to use the VCR for time shifting. They were also going to use it for librarying. In other words, uh, making copies, keeping copies, and watching those copies multiple times, or even giving those copies, or perhaps selling those copies to other people. And the movie studio said, look, that's a, a potential and, uh, uh, and uh, a non-permitted, non-fair use of this work piece of technology. We think that's what people are going to do with it. And because they're going to do that with it, uh, it should not be, uh, uh, it sh we, there shouldn't be a finding of fair use for the, for the sale of this kind of device. In effect, the court said, look, because VCRs have substantial non-infringing uses, right? Recording unprotected shows, recording shows with permission, recording shows for the purpose of time shifting, which the courts found to be a fair use because it did not improperly infringe upon any of the economic interests, at least in the court telling, of the copyright owners. Because substantial uses of the VCR are not infringing, the uh, device itself is not infringing, and therefore the copyright owner's claim must, must fail. Right? So we've got the standing principle out there that so long as a new technology has both infringing and non-infringing uses, if those non-infringing uses are substantial, then typically the technology will be treated as non-infringing. Now, fast forward to the uh, 2000s, we have the internet, and uh, there were early file sharing sites uh, like Napster, Grokster, uh, LimeWire, so on and so forth. Those were in effect providing technology that could be used in many different ways, including copyright infringement. Uh, and so when those sites were sued by uh, music companies and movie companies, uh, their response was, look, we're just providing technology that can be used in lots of different ways. Um, some are infringing, some are not, therefore we should be treated as non-infringing, just like Sony was when it produced a VCR. And the court, the Supreme Court went, went the other way. Right. It says, yeah, there are arguably non-infringing uses, uh, but the infringing uses far outnumber them. And in addition, you're encouraging consumers to use the product in infringing ways. Therefore, we're going to find that you are secondarily liable for copyright infringement committed by your consumers on the basis of the product that you're providing. Query whether the court got it right, and we can talk about that in class.